for the eighth Psalm. And what I want to do simply this morning is share with you four insights that come, I believe, from this grand Psalm of the Judeo Christian faith. First of all, this we need to renew our sense of the holiness of God. We modern religious folk, we modern Christians need to renew our sense of the holiness of God. The psalm begins with those marvelous words, how majestic, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And as you start from that first verse, go out through the psalm, you clearly see the theme of the creative power of God. But one biblical scholar says, if you go deeper, this psalm is really about the majesty, the mystery, the wonder, the transcendence, the holiness of Almighty God. And here's what he says. None of us want the God of the past before whom hum human beings were supposed to shake and tremble and feel nothing but spiritual dread. At the same time, we live now in a cultural and religious setting in which God is more trivialized than glorified, whose divine nature is more easily accessible than transcendent, whose moral and spiritual codes are seen as guidelines rather than expectations. Our culture likes a God we can manage rather than a God who seeks to manage us. The end result is a laxer morality, less than sensitivity to importance of the worship of God, and religious leanings more about our desires than God's desires. We want a God that we can manage rather than a God who seeks to manage us. I don't disagree with this biblical scholar that in our culture there is the trivialization of God. Not necessarily intentionally, but as we've gone about our spiritual and religious lives and lived out our faith, we have trivialized the holiness of God. A year ago, around Super Bowl time, the Public Religious Institute, and this is an example of the trivialization of God, the Public Religious Institute did a poll among football sports fans of the role that God played in the Super Bowl. Now you may say, who's spending their time doing a poll like that? The end result was that 70 million Americans, 70 million Americans believe that in one way or another, in one fashion or another, God had a desire for who would win the Super Bowl and might even be involved in the fate of the game. I don't want to condemn those folks. I don't want to indict anybody. But well, what have we done with God when the best thing we can say about God is he's got a favorite in the Super Bowl? We have trivialized God. Let me tell you the consequences when we trivialize God. First of all, we can easily assume God is on our side. You know, if he's the God I manage, as opposed to the Lord God of history, he's got to be on my side. Because the God I know, the God I want, is the God who's on my side. Secondly, we can assume, no matter our unfaithfulness or our disobedience, that God is not too bothered. When we reduce God, then we just say, you know, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, and God's okay with it all. We have reduced God to our management. Thirdly, we become lax in our sense of our unworthiness before God's holiness. As the biblical scholar said, I don't want the hell and brimstone fire God any more than you do. But I do want a God who calls me to bow down and worship. I do want a God who helps me understand my unworthiness before his holiness. And finally, when we trivialize God, we only partially seek God's divine will in our actions and our lives. He's sort of a distant, distant entity as opposed to the Lord God of history, the Lord God of our lives, who deserves our full obedience. That's the first thing. This psalm, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, calls us to renew our sense of the holiness of of God. Having said that, however, this psalm also tells us that we can be partners in God's redemptive work. The psalmist says, 
You have made them. God has made them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Who's he talking about? Humanity. So the God who is transcendent, the God who is majestic, the God who is mysterious, and the God who is holy is also a God who calls you and me to step up to a level of credibility, to be recognized, to be given a place, to have a part. It's not the Lord God of history just somehow in the old deist is Deus fashion just manages the creation without any conversation with us. Quite the opposite. The psalmist says he's lifted humankind up as a little lower than the angels so that we can fulfill the redemptive purpose he has in place. You've heard me say before, and I know this can be overstated, that there is some part of God's plan that won't get done when it needs to get done and won't get done the way it needs to get done if you or I don't do it. I would never say that there's anything in God's plan that won't ultimately be fulfilled because I believe it will be. I will say that there is some part of God's plan that he wants to happen now and he wants to happen a certain way and he wants me to do it. And there's a certain God of, part of God's plan he wants to happen now and he wants to happen in a certain way he wants you to do it. And without that, there is not the same thing he ideally wants. Let me give you an example. After the ascension of Jesus, and you know all this, you don't have to be a church historian to know this, after the ascension of Jesus, uh, Christianity was a fledgling faith, as you know. Uh, initially, a few hundred folks prior to Pentecost, and after Pentecost, a few thousand folks. And it was contained in Judea, in Palestine. The Jesus movement was essentially a Jewish movement claiming Jesus as the Messiah and it was contained geographically right there. You know what God knew? God knew that if the message of Jesus was ever going to get out beyond Judea into the Greco-Roman world, into wider Syria, into Asia Minor, into Greece, into Italy, in the Rome itself, it wouldn't happen through those 12 apostles. It wouldn't happen even through Peter, as gifted as Peter was. God knew this. He knew he needed somebody who could speak Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. He needed somebody who could speak all four languages because the witness was needed throughout the greco roman world. Secondly, he needed somebody who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Greek philosophers of the age. It's one thing to be in Judea talking about Jesus the Messiah. It's another thing to be in Athens hammering it out with the philosophers who've got thousands of years of Greek philosophy to embrace and try to convince them that their philosophy is hogwash relative to the Lord Jesus. He needed a highly intelligent person, a studied person, a learned person, and he needs somebody who loved Gentiles as much as he loved Jews. And guess who it was? The Apostle Paul. That's why in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, you have this dramatic scene where the risen Christ appears to, to uh, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, on his way, by the way, I think you know, to kill Christians. He's on the way to, to bring them back. On the way to Damascus to bring them back. And have brought to trial and kill them. And God reaches down and says, I need you, Saul. I need somebody who can speak four languages. I need somebody who can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the philosophers. I need somebody who loves Gentiles as much as Jews. And so he taps Saul of Tarsus to become the great evangelist and preacher beyond Palestine. And so if you read about the three missionary journeys of Paul, you discover that he went into wider Syria. He went into Asia Minor. He went over here to Greece. He went over here to Italy. Look at a map sometime if you haven't done it already. Look at a map of the three missionary journeys of Paul. He went into Syria. And he went into Asia Minor. And he traveled on over here to Greece. And he traveled over here to Italy. And into Rome itself. Some scholars estimate that by the third end of the third century, this will blow your mind, the end of the third century, Christianity had grown 
from several thousands of people when Paul began his public ministry, or a few thousands of people, to eight million by the end of the third century. Now, obviously, Paul was long dead. He died in 65 AD in Rome, martyred by the Roman Empire, but he had planted the seeds. He had inspired the young. He had inspired other evangelists, other missionaries, and God used him to go out all over that vast part of the world, and Christianity became a dynamic faith as opposed to a fledgling faith. Now, what is your part? What is my part? God needs you. He may be the holy Lord God of history, but he needs you and he needs me. And I'm thankful for that. Third thing is, we need to have a deep sense of gratitude. When the psalmist writes about the majesty of God, and then he writes about God giving us the gift of lifting us, lifting us up as just a little bit lower than the angels, again, giving us credibility, giving us a place, a position, a recognition. I'm grateful to God, and I know you are too. I read an interesting article just this last week while I was working on the sermon. I just went online and put in the word gratitude and came up with this article. Gratitude, the latest self-help trend that could change your life. I just want you to have that article in case you didn't have it already. Listen carefully. Gratitude, colon. The latest self-help trend that could change your life. And the author, who's a journalist, goes on to talk about scientific studies being done about gratitude. He writes, for example, that the American Psychological Association, just this past April, April 2015, reported a study showing that more gratitude was associated, the more grateful you are, with better mood, better sleep, less fatigue, and lower levels of inflammatory biomarkers related to cardiac health. I knew that. You knew that. But he says now it's a big deal in the American Psychological Association that somebody came to the realization that gratitude can do all these things for you. Then he writes that since 2013, the University of California at Berkeley, that's what I said, right, the University of California at Berkeley has offered grants for research advancing, quote, the science and practice of gratitude. And I'll be honest with you, I'm reading this, working on the sermon, and I almost laugh out loud the new trend, the new self-help trend. I wanted to immediately, if I had an email address, type somebody and say, I need you to go start in the book of Genesis and read through the prophets and read into the New Testament and read through Paul's letters and read to the book of Revelation. And guess what you're going to find without any scientific analysis whatsoever? Gratitude makes a difference. And it is one of the primary relationships God wants us to have toward him. And when we do that, we're blessed. Why wouldn't we be grateful to the Lord God of history who gives us place and purpose and recognition? Fourth thing, final thing. We are called to be good stewards of the earth. Perhaps the most well-known part of this psalm, you have put everything under humankind's feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the world, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swims the paths of the sea. You have put everything under humankind's foot. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you'll see that God gave humankind dominion over the face of the earth. And there is not a biblical scholar alive studying the Hebrew in the Old Testament, including the book of Psalms, who's going to let you and me believe that we really are called to have dominion over or to have earth under our feet, doing with it anything we want. And you know that, right? You know that. Having earth under our feet means that we are called to be its stewards, its caretakers, its gardeners, its animal enthusiasts, to take care of this gift. Have you been reading about Pope Francis's encyclical that came out June the 18th? Uh, it's called Praise Be To You. That's the English translation. 
It's 184 pages long, so I haven't read it yet. And I guess as you haven't. But listen to some of the things Pope Francis says. He speaks about the protection of nature, a shared responsibility for the world, the realization that we have no right to destroy the earth, our home, that religion and science must work together for the good of the planet. And then he sums up this. We need to have, quote, an honest and open debate over the care of our planet. You've read those excerpts. Have you been astounded like me at the response to that? From some noted folks? Religious folks shouldn't meddle in politics. Popes shouldn't be talking about science. We don't have any business getting in to those matters. Well, let's see. Genesis said, you'll have dominion over the face of the earth. Psalmist says, he has put all things under our care. I think the message is pretty clear. We do have both privilege and responsibility to this creation of ours. I am just blown away by the ideologies that some people seem to have, and I'll say this as kindly as I can, and then maybe I need to confess afterwards. I'm blown away by the ideologies that some people have that cause them to be so closed-minded. And I'm not saying there's one answer. I came in February of 2011, you may or may not remember, all of wonderful Rick Kirchhoff. And, uh, which by the way, I'm, I don't know that I've ever shared this, how would you like to follow Rick Kirchhoff? <laughs> Among the things you'd want to do in life, if you could make your list, not your bucket list, but your list, one of them wouldn't be to follow Rick Kirchhoff, except for the fact he is such a wonderful person, a good friend, and such a faithful mentor. Anyway, May of that year, I preached a sermon titled Friends of Creation. And in that sermon, I made four points. Surprise you, huh? Four points. All the way back then, four points. Creation is a gift from God. That was my first point. The Bible calls us to be good stewards of creation. Second point. Third point, we each need to be personally proactive now. Fourth point, we at Germantown can be an intentional creation care church. So I preached the sermon. I've been here two months. I don't know anybody. There are a whole bunch of folks I don't know now. I don't know anybody then. And I'm greeting at that door, and a guy comes out, and, and listen, I do not know this person. So I can honestly tell this story without, without indicting anybody. So I preached the sermon, Friends of Creation. You heard the four points. It's about being good stewards of God's creation, calling us to step up. I've been calling this church to step up and do some things differently, which, by the way, we've implemented. So I'm at the door, and, and the guy comes out, and, uh, you know, he takes my hand, reaches out and takes my hand. I do remember he's a rather large guy. He, he takes my hand, and he says, and I'm thinking, you know, he's at least going to greet me, welcome preacher, whatever, and he says, well, I guess next time we'll have to vote Democrat. I said, pardon me? He said, I guess next time you'll preach a sermon on having to vote Democrat. This is not about being Republican or Democrat. This is not about being liberal or conservative. This is not about a certain ideology vis-a-vis -vis another ideology. This is about the claim of the Lord God of history that you and I have been vested with responsibility to take care of this gift. And so we need to be in an honest dialogue about what that means. Four things. Here's the four things I want you to remember about this. We can take seriously that we people of faith cannot ignore this God-given responsibility. It's not up to the politicians. It's not up to the scientists to make the decisions about this earth. It belongs with us as well. The second thing, we need to read and study and be informed. I don't want to just listen to somebody who I've always read. Why wouldn't I want to read those I've never read about global warming, about climate change, about all the things that are part of it. Third thing, we can listen to varying perspectives. I'll admit I'm as stubborn as anybody when it comes to liking my position. But I'm not doing God much service if the only person I ever listen to are people who agree with me. And on this complex, volatile issue of climate change and global warming, 
and the care of the animals. We need to listen to each other. As, Paul, as Pope Francis said, honest debate. Finally, we each need to do something to have a more sustainable lifestyle. I don't know what your decision is or what your need is. I know what Richard and Pat Smith have done and still need to do for our lifestyle to be more sustainable. The psalmist invites us to care for this gift of creation in the world. Great psalm. Which says, first of all, we need to renew our sense of the holiness of God. And then we need to be willing to partner with this holy God in his redemptive plan, doing what we can, where we can, when we can. And we need to be grateful. And we need to take care of this planet. It's God's gift, and it's our home. Thanks be to God.